Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. This is Nancy Lurie. I am the COO of the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation, and we are so happy uh, to have the opportunity to welcome you to this, uh, to this call and so glad to be able to provide this opportunity to Dr. Carrillo and the NIH to be able to address all of you today. I'm going to just uh, introduce Tara Vogel, who will introduce Dr. Carrillo to you. I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with Tara. She is NDF's patient advocacy program, one of two patient advocacy program managers, along with Amy Curran, and a certified patient advocate. And um, as you know, a, a huge advocate, cheerleader, um, and friend to all of us in the GNEM community. So Tara, I'll let you take it away and introduce Dr. Creo. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, I'm Tara Vogel, and I'm also a GNEM patient. I'd like to welcome and thank you all for joining us today for this very important webinar. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Carrillo, who is, a, who is the principal investigator for GNEM at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I've known Dr. Carrillo since 2011. And I must say, she works diligently on our disease with the eyes of a detective. Dr. Carrillo follows one of the largest cohorts of national and international patients with GNE myopathy at the NIH Clinical Center. And she is interested in understanding the natural history of the disease and advancing promising therapies such as MANAC for GNE myopathy. Dr. Carrillo has led multidisciplinary collaborations to develop endpoints, biomarkers, biomark and novel trial designs for GNEM, for GNE myopathy. I know many of you have met Dr. Carrillo, participated in one of the NIH trials, and have been eagerly waiting for this webinar. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Carrillo, who will discuss the results of the open label phase two MANAC trial. Dr. Carrillo. Thank you for the introduction, Mrs. Vogel. I um, wanted to thank NDF, Nancy, and especially Mrs. Vogel for uh, allowing us to have this webinar with you today. Um, I know it's been probably a while and you've been wondering why I haven't presented these results to you. And so I'm happy that I finally do it. And I apologize, I wasn't able to participate in the last two recent uh, NDF patient days. Um, so I think we can take this opportunity to present to you uh, the results of these open label early phase two trial that we conducted for MANA and take any questions that you might have. Um, what I thought we could do is um, I will have the presentation and then at the end I can take questions and I can go back to a specific slide if uh, any of you in the call would like to review something. If, I'm just going to add one thing. If any of you have questions, you can, while we're going, feel free to type them in the chat if you're online, and we can keep track of them and ask them on your behalf at the end so that we don't have a whole bunch of microphones going at the same time. We can see how it goes, but feel free to type your questions as we're going. Okay, great. And I also wanted to let you know that these results were presented in May at the American Academy of Neurology. They will be presented next month at the American Society of Human Genetics. And soon after that, we hope to be able to share uh, the publication with all of you uh, to have. And we can send that full uh, publication to NDF for distribution. Perfect. So, you know, this is just an introductory slide. And, you know, all of you are familiar with this. In fact, all of you had taught me everything I know about this disease over the last um, almost 10 years that I have been studying this disease. There are a couple of things that I think are important as patients and as researchers to understand about GNE myopathy, um, about how slowly it progresses, and on top of the fact that it's a very uh, rare disease with 
similar characteristics to other diseases that may be confused at several stages of the disease. And all of these, the fact that it's rare, the fact that it slowly progresses, and the fact that it can be confused with other diseases unless uh, appropriate muscle biopsy and genetic testing are performed, um, makes it very complicated uh, for researchers to be able to do clinical trials that are able to differentiate a treatment effect. So even if the disease may not have, um, may have a treatment, sometimes um, because it's a very slowly progressive disease, we are limited in our ability to be able to determine treatment effect. And so one of the reasons in which and we've been focused over the last several years is understand this progression and understand the disease at a very detailed level, uh, both at the cellular level, at the tissue level, and at the functional and um, quality of life level, so we are able to do clinical trials that are in fact able to determine whether not just MANAC, but any therapy that comes in the future uh, may or may not be um, efficacious. And, and, and this is, um, an issue that a lot of other rare diseases and a lot of other slowly progressive diseases um, uh, are facing currently. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about this because this is the basis of most of the things I'm going to explain in the in the presentation. And please stop me if I know that for those that had come to the NIH, I have uh, shown this, and I know it's, um, it's, a, it's a complex thing to understand, and I just want to make sure that, that we all understand these bases before I move on to what we've been able to find as part of this study. The most important thing I want to show here is that the defect in gene myopathy is in the conversion of the sugar that's called UDP glucnac into MANAC and then MANAC 6 phosphate. These two steps are performed by the same, by different pieces of the same enzyme. And before it was thought that if you had GNE myopathy, but only had changes in the MANAC kinase domain, that MANA wouldn't be useful to you. And in fact, we have found that not to be true. Um, in the same protein that performs this function, in fact, the kinase, even if there's a change in the kinase domain here, it affects the enzymatic activity of the epimeric, which is this step. This is an important thing to know. Um, and one that we have has been shown by Dr. Schinderlich at the uh, cellular enzymatic level and that we were also able to show on our phase one trial. So for patients, it's important to know that um, in general, no matter where the change um, may be in the GE, there is a potential for, for MANAC or other therapies that enter these steps to be efficacious. So that's point number one. Point number two is the pathophysiology by which we believe at least one of the main consequences of GNE myopathy is that not only decreased production of sialic acid, but the sialic acid that gets converted into here, what is called CMP sialic acid, which is actually what attaches sialic acid to the protein. So the, the true defect in GNA myopathy is, is thought to be the decreased amount of sialic acid that gets attached to proteins in the, that live in the surface of the muscle, um, at least one of the major pathophysiology mechanisms. There are other pathophysiology mechanisms, but this is thought to be one of the primary ones. Um, so it's important to know that for proteins to have the sialic acid attached to them, this is, every, this is happening inside of the muscle cell, 
not outside. So if you have a lot of sialic acid, for example, circulating in your blood, it's not going to go and attach to the muscle protein. It actually needs to cross inside of the cell, be incorporated in this pathway, ultimately be converted into the key element of the pathway, which is CMP sialic acid, which is the one that is present the moment each protein of the muscle is formed and attaches a sialic acid to it. So for that, it's important that whatever medication that we want to give into this pathway, it's actually inside of the cell. Um, and therefore, um, the way that we have structured our trial have been in the order um, to determine each one of these steps. And I'll show that to you in a little bit. Um, so that when there is no MANAC, then there is no sialic acid, there's no CMP sialic acid, and ultimately there's no um, sialic acid attached to the muscle proteins on the surface of the, of the, of the muscle. But where you give MANAC, or if you would give sialic acid that actually enters the cell, then you would have um, a restoration potentially of that pathway. And you both know, you all know that MANAC um, has been shown in a mouse model to be efficacious. This was back in 2007, 2008, and 2009. Um, in mouse models that at that time, in the way they were generated, recapitulated the, the phenotype of the disease, although more recently, um, different, different mouse backgrounds and other complications may have made some of these mouse models not as uh, good as they were before, but it was shown at that time that both MANAC as well as sialic acid and sialic lactose had efficacy on mouse models. And that's when different um, clinical trials were initiated to study these compounds further. Um, our, phase, our phase one study of MANAC was conducted in 2012. Um, this was considered a, a first in human because MANAC not been given to, to humans before. We did not know whether MANAC was going to be absorbed into the blood. We didn't know if MANAC was going to cross inside of the cells. And we didn't know if MANAC was going to be uh, safe in humans, even though we had a lot of information um, to suggest that it was going to be very safe. So we conducted this study um, with single doses. And in fact, we were able to show that when we gave MANAC, there was an increase uh, in sialic acid that lasted, as you can see here, for up to two days. Now, we know from the ultragenic studies that the half-life of sialic acid is very short. In fact, it's very similar to the one of MANAC. So you can see MANAC here in gray. Patients take MANAC. The MANAC levels get right in the blood very quickly, meaning they absorb pretty quickly. But the levels fall very quickly too, because they're, they, ha they are being excreted into the urine. And sialic acid has almost an identical curve, which is why they made um, the, the, the extended release version so that it would be a little longer than that. But the incredible thing is once the sialic acid gets produced after administration of MANAC, it remains on the blood for 48 hours. We know that not even the extended release version had such a long term production um, levels of sialic acid in the blood after a single dose. So these really um, suggested and many other studies that we did when uh, on the pharmacokinetics of the drug, they do suggest that these sialic acid that we're sampling in the blood is in fact produced inside of the cells. Um, and the fact that it's elevated, it's because there, this pathway was restored um, for a significant amount of time. And these are all published, uh, this is a published paper. As part of the study, we also understood that patients with uh, changes in kinase kinase 
both kinases are also respond um, equally by, the, by, by producing thialic acid after administration of MANAC. So the reason I'm showing you this is because this is the preamble of what we did for the open label phase two study of MANAC. We knew that very likely MANAC got, got inside of the cells and restored the pathway to produce thialic acid. But we did not know at that time whether that increased production of thialic acid actually made it to the place of uh, uh, action for thialic acid, which is attached to proteins in the surface of muscle cells. And so the main goal for our open label phase, early phase two study trial was obviously to understand longer term safety, longer than a single dose. Um, we originally uh, designed this study as a three month study uh, because the safety was limited at the time and with the option of extending the study as um, safety information became available and both the IRB, the DSMB and the FDA felt that we could continue extending the study based on the safety. Um, we also wanted to understand how multiple doses of MANAC would behave over time and what would would that do to the production of thialic acid over time? And most importantly, we wanted to know whether by giving MANAC, we were able to increase the amount of thialic acid that, that is attached to the muscle proteins. And the reason we wanted to do this before going into clinical efficacy, it is because it's very important to have this proof of concept when it comes to ultimately FDA approval or understanding whether uh, a medication may be useful, you really want to make sure that it's reaching the place where the effect is going to happen at the cellular level. Uh, and so for this, we had a small cohort of 12 patients, uh, all of them with their diagnosis confirmed by uh, having two changes in the g and &E gene that are uh, disease-related, as well as having no investigational drugs for, the, for 90 days before. Um, and they're will, and that they were willing to provide two muscle biopsies, uh, one on the lower extremity and another one on the upper extremity at baseline, and again, at three months, for us to be able to measure the thiolation of, of uh, surface muscle glycoprotein. Um, and then, as, as I mentioned, as safety data and tolerability data, as I'm going to be discussing, was accumulated, we sequentially extended the duration of the trial up until 30 months. And patients received daily doses of six grams twice a day of MANAC for the duration, except at the very last visit in which, sorry, this went forward, in which they received four grams three times a day for us to measure the difference of absorption and thialic acid production, as well as um, tolerability of four grams three times a day versus six grams um, twice a day. And I'm gonna explain to you in a little bit why we did that. Um, so, as I mentioned, the protocol enrolled 12 subjects, and you're going to see that they were representative of patients at very different stages of the disease progression, as well as not just age, um, uh, but also, you know, patients that were used from patients that were using no ambulatory device when they first enrolled in the trial. Uh, so here, only eight out of 12 used an ambulatory device to patients that were at more advanced stages of the disease. And so we wanted to be able to show that uh, patients at different stages of the disease, uh, uh, the effects that we were looking forward. I'm gonna first talk about adverse events. And the, I, I can start by saying that they were no major life-learning safety concerns 
We had no serious adverse events as part of this trial. But the most common adverse events that we had that were actually concerning and that they were very concerning to me in terms of the tolerability um, were all gastrointestinal. Uh, they were mostly grade one, so they weren't putting um, patients in danger, but they were very uncomfortable in a subset of patients. And they included bloating, diarrhea, dyspepsia, and flatulence. And in fact, we had a handful of patients that decided when we were extending this study that because of these adverse events, they, they wanted to no longer uh, continue on the sequential expansions. And so we, we took this very seriously. And over the last two years, we have worked on um, dosing, frequency, uh, and formulation to try to minimize this uh, gastrointestinal issues. Um, other things that we saw were mild, oh, sorry, mild elevations of liver function tests that were uh, usually transient and resolved within their own. Uh, we have uh, one person that uh, after a year and a half of taking MANAC developed uh, high triglycerides. Uh, which we think may have been um, predisposed because of family history. But at this point, our conclusion based on that is that we will continue to measure triglycerides as well as cholesterol uh, and see whether this is truly related or just a coincidence. Um, now, I wanted to talk to you a little. I know these graphs don't make, uh, sometimes are confusing, but the x-axis over here is time after taking a dose, and the y-axis, um, it's the levels of, of plasma manac in blue, and dark blue and light blue, and of sialic acid in orange and red. And this is at day one and at day seven. And what I can, the reason I'm showing you this is we saw the same thing we saw in the phase one, which is that after giving MANAC, we have sustained increase in the levels of plasma sialic acid. And in fact, they build up over time after multiple dosing, which is why day seven, the levels are higher than at day one. And so this was uh, really, um, this was really useful for, for us to see. Um, and we, you can see how, uh, higher doses lead to higher levels and that uh, these levels are sustained over time and that they rise to levels that uh, we believe are reach a steady state after a week of taking MANAC and they are comparable or higher than what was seen at the, with the extended release hyaluronic acid trial in terms of plasma levels at least. Now, I know uh, this slide is mainly showing you what we wanted to know and just focus on the red box over here. The main reason that patients were having problems and gastrointestinal adverse events, bloating, loose stool, flatulence, were because the full dose of Manax wasn't being absorbed at six grams twice daily. So what was happening is there was a limit to how much manax the gut could absorb at a single time. And what was happening is that manax was being left inside the, um, the gastrointestinal tract. It was causing problems and ultimately it was, it was being pooped out. So it, 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 it wasn't even reaching the blood. Um, and so we had a real problem, first because it was causing a lot of uh, uh, patients to be quite uncomfortable, but also because it wasn't being absorbed and it wasn't reaching the, the, the place that it needed for efficacy. Um, and we were able to measure that just by dividing the same daily dose, which is 12 grams, into 
three times daily instead of twice daily. So giving four grams three times a day versus six grams twice a day, we could almost triple the amount of mana that was absorbed. And in fact, because this mana is no longer remaining in the gastrointestinal tract, this would have a significant improvement of um, the tolerability of mana in, in patients taking these, these dose. And so um, we were able, um, and, and these also carried more sialic acid production. So as you can see here, um, if 70, 795 was being produced with six grams twice daily, we're now producing 902 nanograms of ML of sialic acid after taking uh, four grams CID. Uh, bottom line, we think we have uh, these new dosing uh, will minimize the amount of gastrointestinal events that were being seen uh, with the with the dosing, um, and even in patients, and not only that, but the majority of the mana, instead of being left in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, will be absorbed and going into the site. Uh, and so, these new dosing is what's going to be given uh, on the multi-tenor trial. Um, the next slide I wanted to show you uh, the way we determined whether the sialation of the muscle proteins was increased from baseline to three months was first done by making sure the same muscle that was biopsied at three months was the same one as baseline, both on the lower extremity and the upper extremity. And to do that, we did an MRI guided biopsy to ensure not only that muscle that we were sampling wasn't replaced by fat, but in fact, that it, it, it had um, active disease. So here you can see that in this MRI um, of the lower leg, you can see how all the muscle that, that looks opaque here, it's actually muscle that that it's not yet affected. But you can see this area of brightness, what we call a stir bright muscle, which signals active disease. So we went and, and, and sample uh, not muscles that were already replaced by fibro fatty tissue, not muscle that was still not affected, but muscle that was in the active stage of being um, affected. Um, and we, in fact, had a very, uh, very high yield, all of our, with our muscle biopsies, uh, to be a comparable and of good quality and able to, to power our, our analysis to determine that. So we were very happy with this approach. And, and as I was mentioning earlier, as part of the phase one, we showed, and also as part of the study, that there's an in, the MANAC crosses into the cell, restores the pathway, produces more sialic acid, and now we wanted to test whether the surface of the muscle had more sialic acid after, after doing this. And we do this because there is a compound called SNA that is very specific and binds to sialic acid. And so we use this SNA to bind, and so this is the surface of the muscle, and you can see there's a lot of cells, that, this is the surface of the cell, there's a lot of glycoproteins that are sticking their legs out, and on top of that, the, in the red, they, they have the terminal sialic acid, and SNA will bind to that, and SNA has a fluorescent marker on it, so that when we look at it under the microscope, we can quantify the amount of fluorescence that is emitted by the muscle that we're evaluating. So that's how we did it. Um, and I should also say that the stains were done at our lab at the NIH, but the quantification of the actual intensity of SNA was performed by uh, blinded evaluators at the Danians. We gave them the, the samples 
um, without any identifiers. So they didn't know which one was baseline, which one was day 90. So even though we couldn't make this a blinded study because we thought that having muscle biopsies on patients taking placebo would be unethical, we decided to do a single blind uh, in which the evaluators that were determining this amount of SNA would be the, those that were blinded. And so you can see here an example on the left of a picture of a muscle biopsy. Um, and you can see in red, you can see all the, all the um, surface around the muscle in red. And the green, which is the caviolin, C, the caviolin 3, is a protein that's only present on the surface of muscle of viable muscle cells. So basically, we are able to only make sure that the SNA that we're looking at is um, on the same place as the caviolin C, which will signal that that SNA signal or that sialic acid signal is actually coming from the membrane of a muscle cell. And what we saw from baseline to day 90 was a what we called a statistically significant increase in the amount of sialic acid attached to muscle, to the muscle in the, in the patients that uh, participated after 90 days of taking MANAC at doses of six grams twice daily. And, and, and we were very happy with these results. Um, and this is just combining all patients at the same time as a cohort but we also wanted to see what would happen when we uh, divided patients by individually, for example, on their upper extremity, on their lower extremity, and if there were any places where we could see um, whether there had been uh, an issue. So for, we didn't include uh, patients that didn't have a pair of muscle biopsies. So for example, if somebody uh, did not have, decided not to have a second biopsy at day 90, we didn't include that pair because we actually wanted to compare in each individual patient the day 90 to the baseline. So that's why you see empty spots here. But for example, let's look at this. On one patient, there was a significant increase in red is day 90 and in blue is baseline. You can see that at day 90, had significantly more uh, sialic acid than at baseline on the lower extremity muscle that we biopsy. But that was not the same, for example, on the biceps. Um, but here we saw patients on an individual basis. The majority of them, you could see an increase at day 90 with exceptions like this one, like this one, which is pretty much the same and this one, which is pretty much the same. Uh, everybody else seemed to, uh, and this one, seemed to have consistent increases at day 90. And we're going back to these individual samples and trying to understand um, what caused that. But overall, when we look at it as a um, cohort, we can see a significant increase in the amount of, of sialic acid. So with these three steps, we've done what we had set out to do in terms of making sure that MANA gets absorbed, that MANA gets inside of the cells, and that MANA, in fact, leads to an increase in the cellulation of muscle. Um, and now, the, of course, the, the next step will be to measure whether there is a flowing um, in the rate of progression of the disease as measured by performance measures as well as quality of life. And even though the purpose of this trial was not to perform this, because for that, as you know, you need a multi, uh, you know, double blind placebo controlled, much bigger trial, we, were, we wanted to know which one were the best ways to measure uh, these clinical endpoints for for a clinical trial. A clinical endpoint is the, the test that you use to measure uh, that a medicine is in fact working. And what we are frequently seeing, not only in GNE myopathy, but in many other diseases, 
is that the type of measures that are being chosen for clinical trials are not the appropriate ones, and that's why clinical trials are failing. And we wanted to fit in, and we wanted to avoid this for our our trial, um, because as you you I some of these have seen this figure already. So this is uh, the muscle progression in GNE myopathy spanning 60 years. And so you can see how not all, and you know this, the muscles get affected, some muscles get affected at different stages on the disease. But what we want is a therapy that can help someone that is here as well as a person that is uh, at later stages of the disease because um, at any of these stages, we think that there are uh, important functions to be maintained with a the therapy. Um, and so we evaluated different measures that people have done, either as part of our studies or in other muscle disease trials, or for example, measures that were done by, um, by Ultragenics, and we wanted to understand how many patients would you need if you use those measures. And so we know the, now we know, for example, at a year, um, how quickly those measures are being declined. And that helps us significantly understand what needs to be chosen as an endpoint, what is more sensitive to measure effect. And we chose uh, the quantitative muscle strength assessment who many of you may have done with the QMA, uh, not only is very sensitive, but we can focus on um, also the muscles of the patients that are actively progressing. And we measure this at every time point of our trial, from baseline to six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, and 30 months. Um, I'm showing you here 12 months and 18 months because the 24 and the 30 months were not as reliable. First, because we had some of the patients that have left the trial because of tolerability concerns, but also there was um, a main uh, part of the QMA, the grip, and that grip um, uh, measurement uh, turned out to be failing during those two last time points. But you can see here at 12 months, that there was um, 39 slowing on the rate of decline. And then at 18 months, we showed almost a slowing of the rate of decline of 50%. So um, slowing the rate of decline by 50, meaning, for example, if a patient would take uh, 20 years to use a wheelchair, you're, you're slowing the rate of progression by half. That means that instead of 20 years, it will take 40 years for someone to use a wheelchair. So just to give an example of what that means. Um, and we did this not to determine efficacy, but just to see if this was a measure that we thought could be useful for our multi-center trial. And this is in fact the measure that we will be using. The QMA analyzed like this, like how much does it close the rate of decline rather than what is more typically done, which is measure a ton of muscle in kilograms and then average them. And we feel that that really impairs the analysis and dilutes the effect if, it's, if there's one. Um, we, what we also did is we compared the, the, the rate of decline during the trial compared to the natural history study. And we actually saw that even though there was still some decline uh, using the QMA in the phase two, it was significantly slower than the, than the progression that was seen um, with the natural history. Um, and then we did that, for example, in the same way that Ultragenics analyzed their data. We did a similar analysis, and we saw how you know, muscle strength was maintained while compared to the natural history that, that was 
um, although we do not think this is the best way to analyze data, we did the, this analysis as well. Um, and we did that for a variety of other measures, such as the adult myopathy assessment tool. We saw that, in fact, in the phase two trial, there was a little better score at 12 months than a baseline, while on the natural history study, there was um, um, a decline um, at that time point. So, in summary, what we can tell you about the phase two trial is we know that the long term administration of daily oral MANAC is safe, although at doses of six grams twice daily, it causes a lot of gastrointestinal problems, flatulence, bloating, loose stools, that, um, you know, especially in social occasions can lead to a lot of anxiety, um, leading to patients not want to participate in the study. So we took this very seriously and we think we have resolved these issues. Uh, and even though I cannot promise there will be absolutely no gastrointestinal effects, we think that we should have um, diminished them significantly. Um, and the second very exciting point is that we have in fact made sure that MANAC is reaching the site of action. It is not only reaching inside of the muscle cells, but it is causing an increased violation of the muscles. Um, and all of you would probably know is sialic acid is this bouncy molecule. I look at it like a little uh, balloon. It attracts water um, and it, it is it's probably not only uh, has um, a role in the metabolism of the muscle, but it, I think it also has a physical role in terms of um, avoiding the wear and tear with the frequent contraction of the muscle. And, um, and so now our next task is to um, evaluate whether in fact all of these steps of increasing the production of sialic acid, increasing the sialation of muscle glycoproteins will in fact um, lead to um, protection against the uh, muscle atrophy that happens in, in GNA myopathy. So these are all the people that uh, were part of our open label study. Um, the NDF actually played a very significant role uh, in um, providing um, for this study, uh, but most importantly, all the patients and their families that came with them to the trial, we are really thankful because we know that participating in this study wasn't uh, easy, um, but we are really, truly grateful. Um, and now we, I know that some of you are probably waiting and wondering when we're going to start the trial. Um, all that you need to know is that um, we believe that the, most of the work in a trial is in actually getting it ready, making sure that once we conduct it, it will be able to truly tell the difference whether a medication is useful or not. And that even though we are testing MANAC, at this time using this trial platform that we have created uh, that we think is uh, a significant improvement from um, uh, previous trials that are, that are done for slowly progressive diseases. Um, we feel like any other therapy that comes forward, whether it's another compound or whether it's gene therapy, that using the platform that we've created to test this with a much higher degree of confidence and accuracy, uh, it's the other um, consequence of, 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 will be the other consequence of this trial. Not only testing whether MANAC truly works or doesn't work, but also um, developing a better way to measuring um, effect in these um, slowly progressive diseases, which um, the majority of which are having a 
very difficult time getting any uh, product, products approved by the FDA. The majority of rare uh, or orphan drugs that are being approved by the FDA are those that in diseases that are rapidly progressive or in which um, there are very uh, clear endpoints such as, uh, you know, um, patient stop. In, the, the most recent example, I, and I'm sure you saw it, is the gene therapy for SMA that got approved recently. Um, and that they clearly measured the lack of decline in, in, the, in the patients with SMA as they're growing older. So we want to make sure that um, not only rare diseases are being um, having approved therapies, but also those that are slowly progressive and are not as um, you know will take many 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 years of doing clinical trials to do it in a better way and and we hope that these trials can get to do that and we are hoping to have um, live clinical trials dot gov um, uh, posting by October, um, and we hope that many patients want to participate. And we're conducting this through Neuronext, um, who is um, a network of neurological clinical trials in the U.S. And we are now partners with uh, Libyan Biosciences, who has multiple drugs approved for rare diseases. So we hope you can. Uh, we hope to see some of you there. And now I would like to take any questions that people may have, and I'm happy to go back to the, to the slides that relate to your question as well. So uh, this is Nancy. We have, um, I've got a couple of questions that people have typed into the chat, which may be the easiest because we've got quite a few people on the call. I think we're at about 33 people. Um, so I know um, Alok actually asked a question. Have you looked for any biomarkers in blood for monitoring the effects of MANAC? We have looked at many, many biomarkers in blood. Um, none of them are good, unfortunately, so far. Uh, the amount, the concentration of sialic acid could be um, uh, measured as a marker that uh, MANAC is been restoring the pathway, but we, there have not been of all the different biomarkers that we have tested over the many past years, a good biomarker that's reliable, that's consistent, that gives us consistent results over time, we've measured multiple and found that um, we basically haven't found a good marker for, for treatment effects um, uh, in, at the muscle level that can be measured in the blood. So no, even though we've tried really hard. Okay. Um, Imad asked, what, if any, are the new primary endpoints you would be looking into for the upcoming multicenter trial? So the primary endpoint will be the QMA, the muscle strength measured by the QMA. Um, and for, for those of you that have come to the NIH, that's the one that Joe Schrader does in the big um, kind of uh, metal bed. That will be the primary endpoint of the trial. Um, we will have a, a secondary, uh, a key secondary endpoint that's based on a, on, a, on a new and improved patient reported outcome that has been generated over the last several years. Um, but that would be a secondary endpoint, not a, not a primary. And that was because the FDA requested that a better patient reported outcome was generated to support the findings of the muscle strength. Okay. Uh, thank you. Aaron has asked, what are the steps to become a member of the October trial? Once the clinical trial uh, link uh, goes live, which I will share with NDF and NDF can share it with everyone or post it on their website, there will be, as part of that um, clinicaltrials.gov listing, there will be the names of the sites and the contact information for their coordinators 
And so what patients would need to do once they are, um, once the, the trial is ready to recruit, will be to, to call their closest site, uh, to, you know, to start the process of being enrolled. Um, and then uh, there's going to need a step of providing genetic testing um, before the screening visit is scheduled. So there's going to be a short phone call. Um, the site may request the genetic testing results at that time. And once they have the genetic testing results, they will schedule a screening visit in which a series of tests, it will take a day. Uh, and then after that, they will evaluate those screening tests and see whether the patients are eligible to participate. And if they are, they will come back for a baseline visit. Okay, it looks like we have quite a few questions about, not surprisingly about that. Um, uh, let's see, let me go back to Michaela though. Michaela asked, in regards to the intensity of SNA, I understand the increase was found statistically significant as a cohort, but will you continue to investigate why in some patients the biopsies do not show a real difference? So, yes, uh, it, w when it is statistically significant, the, and we used a very stringent version of statistical significance, so we know that this is certainly incre increased, we will continue to look at the muscle biopsies individually to see what happened and why they didn't um, show the increase, but we are no longer going to take new muscle biopsies from other patients to evaluate this further uh, because we think that uh, that's at, the, at this point beyond uh, the scope and that, you know, just based on a research um, question, it's not ethical to do research muscle biopsies in patients. Okay. Um, Alok had a follow-up question. Uh, did the mouse model study give better results with MANAC than the human trial? Um, I don't think that there is a good way to compare that. The, the, we studied different things. The way they measured the sialic acid in the muscle was completely different from the way that we measured it. Um, the mouse model basically took muscles from the mouse after taking Manax, they ground them up and measured the amount of sialic acid in that pellet. So that could have been sialic acid that was inside of the cell, sialic acid that was attached or not attached to muscle. What we did, we will actually measure the one that was making it and attaching to the proteins on the surface of the muscle. So I would say that our method for measuring is much better and much more specific. Um, and there, because we had a different method, we cannot compare it side to side. But I can tell you that based on the muscle studies, I was actually very happy with the results we got. I, I, I wasn't expecting to get um, such significant results. For the, for the muscle. Okay. Um, Mona, oops, it keeps skipping. Hold on, sorry. Mona has asked, uh, am I right in thinking that any patients who have been on any other trials, such as SA, are not eligible for phase three of MANAC? Um, so all of the inclusion criteria will be posted on clinicaltrials.gov, but as it stands right now, as long as patients have been off MANAC and sialic acid, for a year, they will be eligible. A year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Iman wants to know if all centers are capable of performing the QMAs like Joe Schrader did, uh, has done at NIH. Correct. So to be eligible, a site needed to have the exact same setup as Joe Schrader. Uh, they needed to have an evaluator that was trained. All the evaluators actually met a month ago in Boston to go over training with Joe Schrader, and they are there are there will be measuring there will be measurements among the evaluators if, with kind of a healthy volunteer, and if they don't come if, and if they're not within a certain range of the measurements from Joe Schrader, we will retrain them and they won't be able to to, to be activated as a site. So so yes, yeah, we are being very careful in that all the evaluators are doing it as close to the way it needs to be done. 
so that, you know, there are no confusion or that, you know, we don't want the trial to not be able to measure treatment effects because somebody did the Q&A the wrong way. So we are, these are people that have used Q&A for previous trials, uh, including uh, an ALS trial, um, and they all had already QMAs. So they're actually, with a, a couple of exceptions in which they just got the QMA machine to participate in the trial, the majority are quite experienced uh, people. Okay. It looks like we have quite a few questions about the criteria of the trial. Is that information that is going to be posted in October and something that you can share then, or is there any other information about that that you can offer? Well, I actually have a better idea. It will all be posted on the clinicaltrials.gov, but what I right. can offer is that right after, I know when the clinicaltrials.gov will be posted, what we can do is plan a webinar to answer okay. any questions about participating on the multi-center. Like around the great. time, let's say like a couple of days after the clinical trials went live, we can do this again and answer any questions about that. I think that's a wonderful idea, and I'm sure everyone would appreciate that very much. Um, here is a question. Uh, will patients who are on the placebo arm be converted over to open-label drug arm if you see a statistically significant improvement on early time points? No, we won't. Okay. No, we won't because, because um, even though it's very tempting, and it seems like the nice thing to do, it will actually be counterproductive and it will impair our ability to measure treatment effects. So unfortunately, no. People will remain on their arm for the entire duration of the trial. Okay. Uh, is it helpful to take MANAC when most of the muscle is replaced by fatty tissue? Well, when, that is one of the things that we want to be able to measure. Uh, and so the, the premise is that if there is viable muscle, that, that wherever it is in the body, that that muscle will be protected from progression by MANAC if MANAC is effective. Now, the only thing is we, the muscle groups that are measured as part of the trial, we're not measuring all muscle groups. We're, we, there are six muscle groups that have been measured as part of the trial. And so those would need to have, um, you know, some strength to be able to be eligible for the trial so that we can actually measure the, the effect. Uh, but the goal will be that if MANAC is efficacious, that it would help muscle no matter what part of the body it is. Okay. Uh, one, uh, uh, Sweat wanted to know when, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but when is the new trial going to start approximately after it's posted? Is that information um, you can share? We no, so pretty pretty soon after it's posted. So basically, we are waiting for our main pharmacy to receive the drug from the from the producer that's packaging it, and the day that they receive the drug, we will post it on clinical trials logo. That's how it's going to work. So okay. that soon after that, you know, the recruitment will start very quickly. That's. I'm sure good news to everyone. Uh, someone had asked just about specifically about MANAC if it is taken on an empty stomach or with a meal. Yes, so that's one of the things that we were very interested in understanding. Uh, as part of the trial, we are gonna request patients to take MANAC with food because we found that the absorption of MANAC increases significantly with food. Um, and so, not only are we gonna divide the dose in three times a day, but we're also gonna ask patients to take it with food. And I think over time, the patients will be, you know, that it would just, they, would, they will feel better once they take it with food. It will be better absorbed. Uh, and it doesn't need to be a, a huge meal, just, you know, take it at your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, um, and I, these are questions that you may, say or you know coming with the posting but um a couple of questions what is the phase the length of phase three and will it involve muscle biopsies it will not involve muscle biopsies we're very happy about that i think we've solved that question we will not mm -hmm. be collecting any more muscle biopsies the length of duration would be at least 24 months 
Uh, so basically what's going to happen is we, we will continue to, the, the follow-up visits will be every six months. Uh, and we will continue to bring patients back every six months until the last patient that was enrolled uh, reaches 24 months. So some patients may be 30 months. And for all that duration, they'll receive um, the study drugs. Okay. And are patients outside the United States eligible for phase three? Patients are eligible outside of the United States. The, because there is a patient reported out, outcome, we are, um, one of the criteria is that they are able to effectively communicate with the study team in English because there have no, have been no approved versions in different languages for this particular questionnaire that we're doing. Um, that's what it, and then the NIH will be the one bringing in international patients. So once the clinical trial is dug off his life, we will, you know, if, if none of them are close to you because you're international, you call the NIH and we'll be taking the international patient. Okay. Tara, I think you said that you had a question. Yes, I do. <clears throat> Dr. Carrillo, you mentioned uh, the last two years you worked on uh, dosing, frequency, and formulation. Could you explain the formulation a little more if, if it's not confidential? Well, just what we were mentioning is uh, there was a food effect study done uh, in the last year uh, in healthy volunteers in which multiple variables were evaluated to understand what increased the absorption of MANAC and what, beyond what we did as part of the phase two, we did a new study um, and dosing MANAC at different doses at different times with different types of food, um, you know, mixed in water in a certain way or we're in a certain amount of water. So the way that it will come in the trial, which is going gonna, gonna to tell you to mix the manac in eight ounces of water and take it with food, th those recommendations are actually coming directly from this food effect study that we did. And so that's where the work that has been done for the frequency and the dose and the formulation. So the actual manic hasn't been formulated. No. So the there are no excipients added to the manic. Uh, okay. What happened is the formulation process, the way the manic was being developed, um, was reviewed from the beginning to the end to make sure that because the criteria to be uh, early phase two or a phase one product is different from when you're going to have a phase three. So the whole process of how it's been done, how it's been shipped, how it's been put into pouches, all of those things, things that you guys don't need to care about, but all of that process was reviewed and that's all called formulation. But it, so that you know, the mana will come in a little sachet, in a little pouch that will be opened and mixed into water. So it will be individual doses of manac that will be distributed. For every dose, uh, it will be a little pouch that will be open and mixed in water. So we're not asking patients to measure their own mana. We're not asking patients to take multiple pills or capsules, but this is a, it's a pouch with the right dose in it, and it just needs to be mixed in a glass of water and taken all by mouth immediately. Um, with, with food. Okay, uh, I have one other question here so far, uh, which is, um, as a patient community, this is a, a question sort of coming in general. There are people who are aware of a good number of patients who do take different sources of sialic acid. So when you say that patients should be at least one year off of any source of sialic acid, does it mean that there's no possibility of them to participate at this point? Um, if the criteria be more specific, I think, um, and you'll see it on the clinical trials of good posting, if patients have ever taken 30 or more doses, period, in their life of myonacosialic acid, if the last dose needs to be at least one year off. If, you, if you're just taking a handful of doses here and there, then I think the timeline, don't quote me on this, but I think it's six months. Okay. Um, so, yes. 
So, and, and I want to, everybody to understand this is very important. When you decide to participate in this trial, this is, this is a, a, right now the only chance that we have to prove whether a therapy for DNA myopathy works or not. This might be, you know, there might be new therapies coming in the next couple of years, gene therapy, whatever you like. But right now, this is the only one that is close to getting any approval. The most, what we don't want is patients that have been taking sialic acid or sialic lactose, and they have resialated their muscle because we don't know how long the muscle remains with sialic acid after you've taken these compounds, with, but we think a year is safe. And that patient ends up being on the placebo group. And then the difference between the, of the placebo group and the treatment group cannot be differentiated and they both look the same. And then now we have no, we, can, we cannot measure efficacy because a patient that is taking uh, a drug that may be efficacious or took it recently ends up in the placebo group and so it looks like the, the treatment group. And so that is, in, then we will never be able to differentiate between um, whether MANAC is effective or not. So this is why we're not um, taking this patient and why we're being very important. And then we are not gonna be able to go into your muscle and measure the sialic acid in your muscle. We're not gonna do that to make you eligible. But, but at, at this point, we really are gonna be trusting the patients that want to participate to do the right thing because um, we really, really, really want to know whether MANAC works or not. And if patients are taking other compounds near the trial or less than a year away, it's all a cumulative effect, and it reduces our chances of being able to measure these difference. Um, and I know it's hard knowing that there may be something out there that helps you, but we want to actually prove that somebody, that something may be helpful. Uh, and, we, and we cannot do that if there are factors that are confounding that effect. And okay. so, yes, that criteria is there for an, an important reason. Okay. Some of these are questions that I think um, you'll be able to answer in our next webinar. I think knowing that that's coming will be will be very helpful um, and satisfying to people. But um, they have a couple of questions specifically, like about the sachets. Uh, will there will they be labeled with some sort of information of the content and uh, do you anticipate any restrictions carrying the medication in checked or carry-on luggage? No, we we didn't even we the, so they would have um, what they would have is labeling telling you how to take it. You won't be able to know whether it's placebo or manac. They look exactly the same. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we had patients bringing one kilogram canisters of white powder through security, and they had a paper saying that that was an investigational drug. And so the same way the carton in which the sachets are going to come in is labeled as an investigational drug, so we know, we don't anticipate any issues. Uh, we've gone through this on the phase two, and uh, there were no issues with it. So no, okay. we don't think there an issue. Okay, so I definitely think people are anxious to um, to see the posting happen, and I've gotten a couple of questions just to say, you know, they've waited so long for this phase three, can they sort of count on at this point, October being a realistic start date? Is that something I you do feel? Not, I do not, again, it all depends on a very long um, supply chain that right. I do not control. I, I do need patients to understand that we are not making the MANAC at the NIH it has been made in New Zealand. It has been shipped to, to Pennsylvania. It has been packed and it needs to go to Rochester. We need to have all the sites ready. Um, no, I will not. We are hoping that that is going to be the case. But as you know, we have hoped for many different dates that have not come through. Um, so I do appreciate everybody's patience for the start of the trial. Our most important goal is not to start the trial fast. Our most important goal is once the trial starts, 
the trial is as good as it can be. I think uh, everyone no would agree with you. I, th I don't think you'd get any argument on that. Uh, I think that we have actually covered all of the questions that uh, that we've had to date. I think it's exciting for everyone who's been able to listen and people have been very thankful online and appreciative of the information that you've been able and willing to share. I think knowing that there's another webinar coming up once um, the information is posted, we'll get that planned and we'll get the registration up for it just as soon as we are able and, and we'll move forward. Dr. Creo, did you have anything you wanted to say in closing? No, I just appreciate everybody patience and you know willingness and interest i think that this is a one of the things that keeps me going it is just such a wonderful community of people to work with uh obviously we've had many rough patches you know bringing forward manac or any other therapy that comes through and really uh what has kept me going is the people that and the patients um and so I'm, I'm actually, I feel lucky of working with such great people. And as, as desperate as you are of, for this trial to start, I'm even more desperate because I haven't seen patients in so long. And I really miss you guys. I want to see you again very soon. Okay, Tara, do you want to wrap things up real quick? Yeah, I want to thank Dr. Correa for taking the time to present to us, our community, the results of phase two. Uh, manic trial. And I want to thank you, Nancy, for helping us and uh, providing the platform for us to join in this call today. And most of all, I want to thank my fellow GNEM MERS for joining us today. We're all in this fight together and we will win. So have a good conclusion to your day until we talk again next time. Take care. And Tara, we have to thank you for being a champion for everyone. So if it weren't for you, the, you know, this uh, you you really helped make this happen. So thank you to Tara as well. Thank you to everyone. And um, until we meet again, hopefully sometime soon.